Hello, us, us. how are you? Uh, welcome back. Uh, today's the last day in our series on the Kihon. And today we're going to look at the last two techniques that are practiced generally, the back kick and the mawashigeri. Okay, two really key kicks, um, very important in, in Kyokushin. Uh, there's variations of both, so we'll try to cover them uh, as best we can. But we most importantly want to cover the mechanics of the uh, kicks um, in both, and particularly the back kick, because um, I got very strongly influenced by Benny the Jet. I think I know it was before 87 because I used the technique in the world tournament. I used his style of back kicks in the world tournament in 87. So whether it was early 87 or before that, I can't remember. Um, but anyway, the back kick, Mawashigeti, Mawashigeti, done with the ball of the foot, the toes, the instep, or the shin. And they're all um, dependent on the range. Uh, and also what happens is with Mawashigeti is they can be incredibly deceptive when they're done from range three essentially yeah close in where they're close enough to hit i remember koichi kawabata shihan one of the greats of the early days he was a yellow belt uchideshi when i first trained at hombu he ended up fighting uh the great aussie tony bowden in the second world tournament and uh he used to i remember a training so here's an amazing thing he was training as an uchideshi they traditionally trained for a thousand days they actually trained a little longer but he wanted to do a million kicks, a million mawashigeri. So every day without fail, he did a thousand mawashigeris on the punch bag. And I used to train in Ichibu and he'd be there in Ichibu just doing the mawashigeri. He got so good that he, I remember he used to put his hand like this next to the wall. He'd be that close to the wall and he'd do the mawashigeris over his head like wow. that. So he was able to do the mawashigeri. Short guy, maybe five foot seven, but he'd, he'd get in close and then bang, knock guys out like that. Um, Midori Kenji, the great Midori Kenji, his roundhouse kicks, I think, are probably uh, unique. And the thing that made his roundhouse kicks so incredible were the, the explosiveness, that incredible yeah. explosiveness. He would slide. With yeah, his slide in and just... Um, he was way beyond kick range and you would bet your life that he couldn't reach you and then you'd wake up a couple of minutes later wondering what happened. So Kyogushin is actually um, populated with the most incredible kickers and I'm definitely not one of them. But we'll do our best to explain the fundamentals and the principles behind it. Okay, so we've got this set up here for us. I'm just going to make a couple of adjustments and then we'll how's that i'm going to put this under there and move away okie doke so here we are in our new studio <laughs> here's a great photo by the way this was on the wall we thought we'd take it down just but isn't that a fantastic photo and just so you know where we are this is the building this one here is the building that we're doing our video in on the sixth floor of that. And that's Surface Paradise. That's where I was born and bred, right near those buildings there. I oh, know these buildings here. But anyway, that's Surface Paradise. When you come to Australia to train with us, that's where you'll be. Okie doke. So, Mawashigeti, roundhouse kick, it's commonly called. There's different ways to chamber it. Could I borrow you, Mitch? So, the, the different ways to do it, I'm just going to use Mitch for balance. First of all, it's really good to teach your students to extend backwards in this fashion. So when you do the, um, uh, the basics, uh, we're doing Mawashi getting four back kick. You do the back kick, then Mawashi getting. But you want to make sure you turn your feet out once again to protect your knees. You turn your feet out much more than normal, and you try to bring the leg as much to the side as possible. It's very easy for people to just go like that. And when your objective becomes the volume 
That's what happens. If your objective is volume, there's a correlation, an inverse correlation between volume and technical accuracy. There's no doubt about it. So if you want to be very accurate and work your kicks, don't try and do it in basics because it's very hard to maintain the fine detail of a, uh, of a technique when you're focused on the uh, volume. But anyway, we, we kind of try to tuck it up to the side there and, and kick it around. One, two, one, two, one, two. See, like that. You can tell I haven't got very good roundhouse kick anymore. But the, 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 what I'm saying is you pull it up to the side. Okay, so in standing basics, you turn your feet out, gun man cover, and you throw the kicks. It's really important that you develop the habit of maintaining the cox comb. So when I throw with the right roundhouse, my left hand kicks. So let's do that. Ready? One. There. See, this hand stays up. Two, three, four, five, six, like that. Okay? You get used to that. You can do them with your hands in the hips, uh, but generally speaking, in uh, basics, in hombu under solsai, for the mashigeti, it was gunman cover, hands up. Okay? Try to get your elbows. Remember... The thing about gum and cover is it's not your hand position that's important. It's your elbow position. I can have my hands in exactly the right place, but if my elbows are out of position, everything's wrong. On the other hand, if I have my elbows in the right place, it's very hard for the hands to be in the wrong position. So remember that when you're teaching, make sure that your students have the elbows in the correct place, vertically, excuse me, vertically underneath the hands. Okay? Now... There's different ways to do the mashigeti. First of all, you've got to snap with the ball of the foot or the toes. When I was younger, we used to walk around the dojo on the wooden floor and our toes to strengthen the toes. So we'd stab the toes in underneath the ribs there into the liver and this side into the spleen. It's very effective. And you can do that off the front leg, okay? There like that. You can go there and then there like that, or just pop it in, boom, boom, like that. And you get the toes cutting in to the ribs like that. It's clear that I'm not able to do it very well anymore. But the whole key is let your knee create the trajectory. See, I lead with my knee, and I let my knee pull my body forward like that. If you want to see how it uh, an expert can do it. Watch me do it, Kenji, in the uh, fifth world tournament. Mind blowing, of course. But it's all a lot to do with the uh, obliques, the strength of the obliques, like that. Okay? Um, snap it to the body. Again, you can come up and tuck here. And you can drop it down low. Or you can. <laughs> got, him, got him twice in a row. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so if you let come to side, if you let your setup be the same, so I'm coming here. Boom. There's my setup. Whether that's going there, whether that's going there, or whether that's going up to the head, let your setup be the same. Get used to that. Come in. My setup is that. Where is it going? He shouldn't be able to tell. To make it even more so, you can do Bill Wallace style. Bring this back foot up so it faces away. Now I'm kicking out the back pocket properly. See that? One, back pocket. Bring the knee high. And when I do that, it can be a side kick. It can be a roundhouse kick. It can be a hook kick. And just, just pretend that they're actually going all the way up there, which they're not. Okay, so for the mawashi, you can set it up there using off the front leg. We're just working front leg at the moment. See, you can... Move in and out, and then one, two, one, two. And it's very, you think, yeah, you know, it's wide, wide open, wide open for a thigh kick. He throws a thigh kick, and then you can hook kick like that. That's what Gary used to do. He'd come in here, they thigh kick, and he'd just pick his leg up and hook kick in there like that. So, yes, we realize that, but every technique has its openings. It's nothing is 100% perfect. 
So when you're doing it with the front front foot, you, you come off. See that with the foot exactly straight. You come off there. You can stomp it even. Stomp it. To, so you go from the foot being straight, especially if he throws the thigh kick at you. One. Stomp. Two. See that? So I block it. Bang. And then I stomp it sideways. One. Boom. Bang, bang. Boom. Side kick or one. Boom. Roundhouse kick like that. And that roundhouse kick can come up really sharp. And you should you should use it. Boom. There like that. It's it's um it stinks. Okay. And of course, it's come forward. And of course, what you can do is drop it down into the thigh. And when you're young, you have the flexibility, uh, come over the head. Okay, now there's another important way, of course, the, the, to bring the roundhouse kick off the back leg. But here's an important thing. We do a drill called the stomp turn. You stomp the kicking leg and turn the front leg and kick. Now, the stomp turn serves a couple of purposes. One, it creates a tendon reflex. Two, it allows you to adjust for distance. So if I'm in here and I'm hitting and I'm punching, boom, and I want to step back, I stomp back and then throw the kick. There, stomp back and throw the kick. On the other hand, if he's a kicker and he's, he's throwing kick, boom, I step away, what, and then he starts to run. Now I can do the stomp turn like that. Sorry, I've got some people. So as he runs, yeah, see that? I stomp here. And I can go all the way. So you use that stomp to get the distance. Stomp there like that. So the drill is simply this. Stomp, turn, kick. Okay, I stomp the kicking foot. Now, if I want to kick with a power kick off my front leg, I can stomp it back and turn like that. So my front leg stomps back, back leg turns forward, and you kick like that. So it becomes like that, okay? Another good tip for teaching. You must encourage the students to allow their head to follow the kick in. And that's important because what happens is under pressure against a strong opponent, if your students get a little bit intimidated, they'll throw the kick and they'll fall away because their weight's going back. They don't want to engage too much. So you have to make sure that the head falls in. So the one drill that we used to do, we still do, stomp, turn, kick, and I take my head towards my opponent. Stomp, turn, kick, take my head towards the opponent. That's the drill. And what that drill, and if you're on a punching bag, stomp, turn, kick, headbutt the punching bag. Always encourage the students when they're drilling to bring their head forward. Then what happens is when they're actually sparring, they're not encouraged to drop the weight back like that too much. Okay, that's very important. Off the back leg, you can kick with the the, um, the ball of the foot too. You can kick my washi and kick my washi and then turn into a front kick. Or you can question mark front kick in the roundhouse. Stomp turn, load it back here. Load it back there and then let the body follow. Stomp, turn, like that. Ready? Like this. Stomp, turn, and try to kick like that. Stomp, turn, load it all the way back like that. You make sure that you chamber it to the side, not to the front. Just come forward. There. Stomp, turn, I chamber it here. See that? chamber it behind. And that's why you must get the body weight and the head going forward because that kick trailing must follow the body weight. So I go stomp, turn, and coming through like that. Okay? Now, another really good way to throw a roundhouse kick, and I, I can no longer do it, but you make the knee move in a straight line. This is really deceptive. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get Mitch to do it, but I'm going to so he takes his leg back. One. Yep, and he's going to bring that knee forward. Okay, now that knee stays on a straight trajectory. Now he turns his foot and hips and throws the roundhouse kick like that. So the knee comes through 
but the foot and body turn. See, the knee doesn't change direction. Boom. It's like that. So what happens is, even though the knee is in a straight line, the foot comes around in a circle. It's a bit like the, what they call the question mark tick, kick. Yeah. See, the foot, there's also that style where you come over the top. But you want to make sure, if you could put it like a bio tracer or a light tracer on the knee, the knee would move in a straight line. It doesn't come to the outside. So you have to practice both. Stomp turn, coming to the outside, or bring the knee straight through and turning around that corner. There's some insights into the roundhouse kicks. Um, clearly, one day what I'll do is when my own little son grows up and he can do a good roundhouse kick, I'll do another video. But anyway, so that's the roundhouse kick, uh, Mawashi Getty. It's the last kick we do it. Basics. We're going to do the back kick now. I just want to check out us, us, Rochelle, Dallas Kirkshin. Frederick, how are you feeling? Frederick's been a little crook. He's got a few health issues that um, caught up, surprised him. Of course, good evening, Francis. Marco, how are you? Us, Sensei, Mike, Daniel, good to see you, man. Francis, best way to lift the knee is to put a chair in front. <laughs> yeah, that's true, though. That's what used to us, Aaron. Professor Shiona, Professor Mitch from Damo and Aaron. How are you guys? Um, what time's training start for you to, the, tonight, Aaron, at uh, the dojo? Let me know. I'll pop in. Okay. So you got those those particular styles of throwing the roundhouse kick, remember? The stomp turn drill is the bread and butter to develop the explosiveness in your marshy. Stomp turn. When we do the drill... I add on to it. So here's the way we actually do that drill. We start off stomp, turn, kick. Then stomp, turn, kick, step to bring my head forward. Okay? Stomp, turn, kick, step. And because that foot's forward, watch how I rotate. My footwork is actually one, two. See that? One, two. One, two. So we're in this position. Stomp, turn, kick, step. One, two. See where I finish off? And then tap him on the head. That's the game we play with the kids. Okay? So we're from here. Stomp, turn, kick, step. One, two. Finish this side. To go the other side, because, of the, because I'm a left side forward or a natural side forward fighter, now, when I stomp turn the other side, watch my footwork. I want for the stomp turn with the right leg, stomp, turn, kick. I put my foot right next to his foot. There. That's a that's a, a reminder of how deep I have to step. If I stomp turn, put my foot in front of his foot, then go here, I'm still in his dead range. It's very easy for him to finish hook me off there. Exactly. But if I take my foot, stomp, Turn, kick, put it right next to his foot. Now when I turn, I'm way out of his dead zone. And for him to do anything, he has to make a big turn around to do it. Okay? Stay that side. So with my left leg now, stomp, turn, I kick, boom. And I reach out. Now I don't do the half shuffle turn. I simply rotate my shoulder and I'm already out of the dead zone. So the difference in the footwork. Stomp, turn, kick, place as far as I can past the line of his front foot. And I like to put my shoulder on his elbow. See that? The reason I like to put my shoulder on the elbow is it's very hard for him now. I can feel him through my shoulder. So if he starts to move, I can feel it and I can just move away. Okay? The other thing I like to do, stomp, turn, kick, place, roll. If I get in this position, I'm yeah. set up for a nice liver shot. There, because I've chambered my right shoulder forward. And then what I do is I use the rotational force, which is the hip and the shoulder, rotate, and I'm straight out of his dead zone there. So the left side footwork, stomp, turn, kick, step, rotate. The right side footwork, stomp, turn, kick, place, step, like that. That's a really good drill that you can have your students doing 
to develop that rotation outside of the dead zone after they finish the technique. Okay, let's have a quick look at the comments. Yeah, that comment about putting the chair in front, that's actually a really, really good way to develop that, that drill. Hey, Shannon, friend, my friend. Wow, nice to see you. Shannon was a great karate fighter who joined in and trained with us in Brisbane for a couple of years, uh, and he ended up going on to big things. He was like the bodyguard for some famous band for 25 years. Cool. Good on you, Shannon. Last time I saw Shannon was in New York. Nice to see you, man. 26.30, good. Oh, so hope you had a wonderful birthday. Thank you. You both are uh, editing an amazing job. Yeah, you know, Shannon, we're old and grey in our eyes at him and we kind of pretend about how good we used to be. <laughs> That's my saying. I'm not as old as I used to think I was. I'm, I'm not as good as I used to think I was. Yeah, but anyway, nice to see your name there, Shannon. I'm using them constantly with my clients. Oh, good on you. Thanks. That's so good. Shannon was sharp, mate. Fred, oh, so I'm doing better. That's good news. Feel good farm Vermont. Hey, good to see you, man. And Marco, footwork is such a fundamental element of kicking, loving the angles. Yes, very good. Yes, good. A couple of good looking guys. You weren't too bad looking yourself. We miss you. Okay, let's move on to back kick. Now, the, the main thing I want to say about back kick is that back kick is not a side kick to the back. Okay, so a lot of people... When they practice, actually, one second. When they practice the back kick, what they do is they'll turn and do the side kick. Turn. They're not, whoop, they're not doing a back kick. They're doing a side kick to the back. And you can get away with it. Okay? You can do it for 30 years and it'll pull you up. A back kick, the beauty of the Kyogoshin fundamentals, 30 techniques, they work your whole body and they work the different angles. Some techniques go to the front, some go to the side, some are rotational, some are rotational forward. Some pop up, some pop across, some pop down. Okay, the kicks, you're going to the front, you're snapping to the front, pushing to the front, kicking to the side, kicking down to the side, and kicking to the back. So why you've just practiced the side kick, why would you turn around and do the same kick to behind? In reality, in a competition or a fight, if you do that and it works, knock yourself out, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is drilling the correct technique, okay? A back kick should be a kick to the back, not a side kick to the back. So I come in here and I want to tuck and I take my foot straight back. And a good approach to it is I want to keep my knees as close together as possible. If you watch when I do it, a lot of people will turn, the knee comes up to the outside and they throw the kick. What you want to do is, as far as possible, chamber your leg there. See, like that, so it doesn't come outside the line of your body. It goes straight back. You see there? I can't see because I'm kicking. But if I, I imagine that what I want to try and do is kick the kick inside the line of my body. That always makes it harder to see for a start. I go here. Look, it's hard for you to tell where my kick is. I go from here. Look, it's much easier to see the foot. Okay, so you keep everything tucked in and kicking straight back. Okay, now when you do it um, on someone, you have to work this idea now, and this is a little bit of science in this. Force is mass times acceleration. For as far as, for all intents and purposes, for us as human bodies on the earth, mass is our body weight. Okay. And we need to get as much of our mass in the technique as possible. All right? So that generally means our body weight in the kicking leg. This is the funny thing. We're always taught, if I'm kicking here, well, isn't my body weight in the supporting leg? Well, yes, it is. But if you were to do a scientific survey of Midori, somehow weigh the weight of his foot compared to the weight in the kicking foot, I can guarantee London to a brick that all the weight is in the kicking foot. So we have to work on a way to make sure that your body weight is in your kick. Now, here's the way that I worked on it. Fundamentally, I got the, the basics off um, Sensei Benny the Jet, one of the greats. Um, and I, it's, It was 1986 or 87, so I don't know if I've changed it since then. 
But generally speaking, here's the drum. We're here like this. I throw the hand out and I clap my hands. That's what I used to teach. One, clap. One, clap, rotate. So I'd be here. You go one, clap, rotate. You see that? Now, I'm kicking with my right leg, but my weight is on my right leg. Most people make the mistake when they throw. Someone gave us a thumbs down, did they? Hello. When they, oh, is that, does that mean the sound's not working? Good. No, all good. Yeah. What can you do to increase the, to kick higher? Okay, we'll address that later. All right, so what I want to do is most people would go here when they throw the back kick, they put the weight on the support leg. So there's no weight on this leg. See that? No weight on this leg. Now, that's where kinetic energy comes in, of course, half mass times velocity squared. If the lightness in the leg means that you can kick really fast and you want to look up the great, great fighter, Manson Gibson. Check him out. Unbelievable. He would come off because that leg would then come up fast, but he'd turn it around and hook it into a spin back kick. So that's a different thing altogether. What we're working on is getting body weight into the kick. So what we do is we come here and I rotate. Feel your balance. Look, all my weight is in my kicking leg now, and my, my arm is ready to counterbalance. As the kick goes out, my arm goes back. And from there, what I do, oh, I'll just like, from there, I just kick straight back. And if you want to look at it from the front, what I tell myself is I want to keep my knees together. And one way to do it is I kick my foot into the knee. See that? You can hear it. So you get a double kick there. I'm here. That makes, that ensures that your foot. You can hear the double kick is staying within the line of your body. So here we are. One, two, I spin, I get my balance, which I don't have because I have no right knee. But I put my weight in the kicking leg. Okay, and I counter torque. So I have this arc of tension building across. My left leg is back, my right shoulder is back. Then when I unwind that, two things happen. One, I get a reflex, a tendon reflex of the kick going out. Two, I don't lose my balance. Because quite often what happens is if I don't counterbalance and I throw the kick and my opponent gets out of the way completely, boom, I lose control and that happens. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to counterbalance. So if you watch this time, I'll do the same kick. But Mitch gets out of the way and I don't hit anything. But because I've counterbalanced, it's allowed me to maintain my balance. Quite often, guys will get out of the way and they'll just come back in. They'll get out of the way and they'll come straight back in to counter fight. So I go, one, as they come back in, I, because I have my balance, I can kick again. Yeah. Yeah. Just saw another thumbs down. Okay, we're getting lots of thumbs down. Here, like this. See this? I'm going to come in. One, put it down. Two. And then you can you can skip it too. So I go one, and you get a shutter in for the second one that can be deceptive. So what we do, one, two, I keep that balance and I feel my balance here. My knees are deeply bent. I even get students to put their knee on the ground to remind them of the shape that they need to have for this kick. I bring this shoulder right back. This hand is here because I've just turned around he could kick me, so I have to have this hand up. I'm here, and then as I kick, I get that movement. As I kick, I get that movement. Okay, so when we do the back kick now, one, spin, boom, back, back, back. Notice I don't step away twice. I don't look away twice. I'm looking at Mitch. I'm looking at Mitch. I look away once. Most people will throw the kick. And come back and look away twice. Never do that. You don't have to. Look away once. I spin, kick, and I keep my eye on him. So I step the opposite leg first, then I rotate, and look how far away you end up. That's a really important facet of it. One, two. Most people will kick and turn on the spot, 
and get knocked out. Yes, like that. The way I do it, the way it should be done, is I kick, step, and he tries to knock me out. He's got a long way to go before he can get there. It has to be Kenji Midori. Kenji Midori is a different thing. Kenji Midori knocks everyone out. So that's the nature of the back kick. We're here like this. Keep my knees bent. And I used to get a nice jump when I had explosive knees. I'd go deep and then you get this nice shudder in with the kick. And once again, after the kick, you put your foot down. I can literally remember when I was fighting tournaments, I go bang, and I'd step away like that. So you get the explosive reflex yeah, you get off so they can't attack you. Exactly. Okay, let's have a quick look and see what these thumbs down are complaining about. <laughs> Maybe it's, I'm not as good looking as I think. My karate is live. Oh, source. To correct the student, Ushiro getting close to the wall with the left shoulder, kick left leg. Yeah, that's a good idea too. What Francis is staying, saying there, if you want to avoid the business of turning and turning your leg out, what you do is you put the left shoulder there and there. there oh, like. yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's a great idea too. So I'm so close that if I did try to turn, I'd hit my knee and it'd upset your balance. I get as close as I can, chain lock, see that? Chain lock and back. Like that. This that, kick, sorry, Sean, this kick that you're doing as well is so important from a balance point of view around the hips too. Keep that in mind. Just so much of kicking, may getty, is a getty, kin getty, um, wash a getty. They're all, and Yoko Gary is a back pocket kick, so it uses the lateral tissues. But Yushiro Gary is literally the only kick that, that uses the hip extensors. Exactly. Not the hip flexors. Not the hip flexors. So, from a balance point of view around the hip, one of the reasons backs and knees hurt and long so balance, you don't mean physical balance, you mean muscle, muscle balance, balance around the hips. Um, I'm not suggesting people do a thousand back kicks to balance it up because you want to do deadlifts and cleans and so on. Hip extension exercises are going to be better to balance it up in general. But you want to make sure you don't cut corners with your shiro getty because it is a fantastic way to balance a hip musculature around the hip, which is done generally poorly in martial arts. There you go. There's a lot of, in, not just karate, yeah. in all sports, there's always a tremendous imbalance between uh, the muscles that are vital for the sport and the muscles that are less vital. In actual fact, all muscles are vital because it's all about that balance around the whole body. Okay, but you know, um, generally speaking, you want to make sure that the front and back are balanced. Now, just going on again with that Francis's comment about being close and having a, you can do the same thing with this technique that we were just practicing against the wall. We're here. Remember, I said you get that kick through as you go past. If you're nice and close to the wall, you can make sure you're doing that without going out. I think that's a great idea. Good one, friends. That's two good ideas you've taught us today. Yeah, good on you. Oh, Shannon, I'm really wrapped that your name turned up, and thanks for your birthday wishes the other day too. Of course, MA. Is that the MA? I think it is. Of course. But anyway, of what can I do to increase flexibility to kick higher? Examples of very stretches. Okay, so what what are the limiting factors to high kicks, Mitch? Um, well, technique, flexibility are the two major things. Um, Flexible where? Uh, it's it's interesting. A, a lot of people think it's just in the hamstrings and groin because you're kicking higher, but it's actually also in the hip flexors. Yes. I've got to have the range to do it. And one of the reasons that uh, people like Kenji Midori and these brilliant kickers from a distance have the weight that you said in their kicking leg for the back kick instead of in the support leg is because they have such great hip flexor flexibility that they're able to actually get hip extension so their hip when they're kicking is not here it's there if that makes i can't do it but, but no that's it, the idea it's twisted and it's here so the, the weight's going forward into the kicking leg that shian was talking about earlier rather than here this is not I mean, you still hit someone with that, but that's not um, the perfect technique the perfect you're looking for. So let me let me show you with Mitch what he's saying. So he does a normal roundhouse kick. Bring it up. Boom. No, you, no a normal one. Oh, I like the way you want. There. You see that? If you have a look, there's an angle here. And it's basically 90 degrees between his body and his leg. See that angle? That's what you're trying to 
extend. You want to create so you go past the 180 degrees. When you look at Kenji Midori and his roundhouse kick, he was actually kicking from about 200 degrees, yeah. 210 degrees, which means his hip is like that. So this is why when you do the hip flexor stretch, you're pushing. And if you can imagine, this bow here is what Kenji Midori had in a standing position when he was throwing the roundhouse kick. So what Mitch is saying now is when he throws the kick the correct way, boom, see this, now that 100, that 90 degree angle has gone to 180 degrees. His, shit, his leg on my shoulder, okay? I hold his hand and now he pushes the hip forward. You see that? Now he's extending, pushing forward the hip flexors. He's stretching hip flexors. The hip flexors being the muscles that flex the hip in front of the body hip that are so underdone in training. And in life, okay? So you get that sort of balance, and he constantly keeps trying to turn his pocket towards me. See that? Now the natural tendency is for the knee to drop. That's my job now. So what I do is I make sure his knee doesn't drop, and then as we come in here, I go up as far as I can. And you see, I start to, I, as I do it, I don't sacrifice hip flexor extension for height. I don't want to go high, so he's, yeah, he does that, yeah. okay? I don't want that. I want to go lower so the hip flexor comes forward. See that? Oh, sorry. So, there, there. So you do it in this order. Knee up. You can go under the knee if you like to stop the stop knee from right dropping. Yeah. We go under the knee, and then he pushes his hips forward by exposing his back pocket. Okay, so this line here along the body is Straight. 180 degrees, yeah. not 90 degrees. I'm not, yeah, I'm not bending forward like that. that. Yes, that is what is commonly done. Now, he keeps pushing that forward, and I can start to come up there. Mitch's That's back foot, you can't see, but his back foot is facing 180 degrees behind. Okay, now you see what he's doing there, and I can come up, and he gives me a tap on the hand, when it gets to the point where, yeah, he starts to, remember when I do it, don't just drop the leg. Okay, so that's a really good exercise you can do. Another one that you can do to help is the standard hip flexor stretch. Yes. Forgive me, but this stretch is, it's the back hip that I'm stretching here. So I don't want to lean forward. Most people come here and they do this. Well, you can see that that's not extending the hip flexors I need to extend the hip flexors by pushing the hips forward. forward. You can increase that even more by putting your foot on a stool. I'll get Mitch to do it. Well, there. What you can do is you put your foot there. Okay, come back a bit. Come back. Oops. Yeah. So you see now when Mitch does it, by putting the foot on the stool, you've increased that extension so much more. Okay, and you can see the, the incredible extension that you get through the hip flexors. And you're stretching the double joint. You're stretching the hip, but also the tissues around the knee as well, which we need in kicking because we're not just doing a hisageri, we're doing a washigeri. So we need to stretch the tissues of yes. both joints, which is often forgotten. So it's very important. And the other kicks you saw, I remember in the mid-90s, a lot of the Brazilian guys, great kickers that I used to watch on the videos and media video back then, they would do a lot of this type of stuff too, you know. Um, for and I think one of your students was yep. um, Yusuke Fuji. Yusuke Fuji, used Yusuke to Fuji was an old that. Japan champion with the Kelkushin Khan. Shout out to Yusuke. He's been living in Russia teaching there for the last 20 years. But he would actually do that in a tournament where he'd be so fast that he'd literally go and he'd grab his foot. And that's what had happened. Yeah. They dropped the hand and then he would go the foot and knock him out. It's very cool. So, uh, so that's some, some, that's a, a very key example of um, hip flexor range. It's important for kicking. But Sian mentioned something too about there's an inverse relationship between uh, volume, volume and, and technical yeah. excellence. So that's the other thing I would suggest um, is be careful what you're rehearsing because if you do when you do stretch and get the range, which is another conversation in itself. When do you want to stretch to get that range if you want your kicks to be higher? Do you want to stretch after or before? You need it before. You need it before. Why? Because you need that new range that you haven't otherwise got. You need to put it in your tissues so that then when you do the kicks, you have the range to kick. And the then, argument that you stretch after training is fallacious as far as I'm concerned. It's, yes. it's popular, but there's nothing to back it. 
because they back it on science, which is very short term minded. Yes. Because you're hot and warm, you feel great. You think, yeah, look, when I stretch after training, I've got such a big range of motion. But for how long? How does that affect you at tomorrow's training? Whereas if you stretch before, you open up the range for that particular day. And then if you want to stretch afterwards, do that as well. Yep. But you need the stretching beforehand because you need it for the techniques you're about to practice. Especially if you want to improve as a guy about kicking higher. And then so you only kick higher as you have that range. So you might only be able to do 10, 15 great kicks day one. Then you come back day three or whatever it is, and then you do 15 or whatever it is, and you build up progressive overload because you want to make sure you're rehearsing the skill that you want. And two other exercises which I'll mention. The first one is the three count, but it's done slightly different. You want to use gravity. Gravity is your friend. I use the acronym GRAB A STRETCH. And if you have a YouTube channel and you've got tens of thousands of followers and you, you love your karate, well, then I don't mind if you use that acronym. Just give credit where credit's due. So I'm here. I, I'm in this position. Okay, now normally we'll just rotate and then flip back to the heel. I like to actually go here and hold this position and push the hip forward and even raise this hand behind and increase the range of this joint, okay, as this part two. Then you come back around and you get the heels on the ground and your objective here is to get the calf on the ground and the hammy on the ground and you let gravity do the work. You grab a stretch. The G in grab is gravity. Okay, the R is relaxation, the A is angle, and the B is breath. Okay, so make sure you get nice and deep here. Then when you switch, you make sure that you let gravity take you down. You just relax and let gravity take you down. Then when you turn, you focus on the hip flexor stretch coming forward here. There like that. Put your arm behind your like. Notice I'm not leaning here, I'm actually pushing against it, pushing against my knee. There, like that, and then turn right around and once again try to get the calf and the hammy towards the ground. Okay, now the second exercise, which I think is the secret for Midori Kenji and Matsui Akiyoshi, or Matsui Shoke, and that's the Shikobumi, the sumo stretch. You come down here. And what you do, this is not a stretch to kick your leg high. It's a stretch to increase the flexibility of the hip flexors and the hamstrings and the hip abductors, uh, adductors on the inside here. So what you do is you come here, you come away, and then this is the leg you're focusing on. And down and stomp into the sumo stomp. Up, I'm stretching the bottom leg. Down like a sumo wrestler. So that stretch, I think, is a super valuable stretch because even though I'm leaning forward, when you do it, you're actually, look, this, this is actually quite extended. Yes. Even though I'm leaning forward, you push off it. There, see, this is the area. Look into the Shiko Bumi. That's the Shiko Stomping, it's called. They're the sumo, that's the sumo stretch. They do, we used to do that for, we didn't do lots. We used to do a lot. We do it frequently. Yeah. yeah, we do it frequently. We do like a hundred, but rather than count, we do it for 10 minutes or we do it for 15 minutes like that. And that way you don't focus on how many you're doing, you focus on how correct well. technique. And so with the, the, the question with that, if you're not putting your body in those positions, don't be surprised, you don't, you're not able to put your body in those positions when kicking. Um, it's, it's very important that you put your body in stretches of those shapes so that you can execute that shape in the technique. There you go. So anyway, uh, thank you, guys. Hope you got something out of it. That's the last of the uh, the um, basics, the Kihon series. Uh, I hope that uh, there's something of value in it for everyone. And what we'll be doing uh, from next week is uh, offering some different types of things. What's next week? Yes, the shield should still be here. Oh, I think we're going to Japan next week. Oh, yeah, we leave on Wednesday next week. So Rochelle's off to Japan in two days. We're off to Japan in a week or so. Uh, so anyway, um, but we will be, maybe in Japan, we'll be able to do something whilst we're there. I don't know. It depends on the timing. But we'll be, I think what we're going to do at some stage is do a video on flexibility training, things that you can do and show you a good solid routine. 
See, when I did yoga, the yoga routine would go for two to two and a half hours. But I said to my yoga teacher, Mark Tobney, one of the greats, can he give me a 15 minute and a 45 minute, 15, 30 and 45 minute routine for uh, karate? And sure, you just, you just break down the two hour routine and you focus on the particular shapes and movements that uh, are most beneficial to your karate. Anyway, thank you guys. Us, Mitch. Thank you, Sean. Once again, it's been a good day, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Us.